Hi there. Welcome to Tech Talk Weekly. I'm Bob from Creation Station. This is our weekly show where we talk about three or four interesting tech topics in the news. I bet you know which one is cool this week. And we'll get you on your way in about 20 minutes. As always, if you have any stories you'd like us to share, creationstation at broward.org comes right to me and we'll be glad to do that. This week, I've got Miss Sonia from out at Weston. How are you doing, Sonia? Oh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me, Bob. Oh, always. It's always so much fun. And we were just talking pre-show. Well, first, wait, wait, wait. What's going on out at Weston? Tell us. What you got going on out there? Well, right now, we are having the schools let out. So we're about to welcome a great many wonderful young people. Oh, when she says many, she's being very cautiously undercounting. <laughs> Weston is one of those branches where they just flood in. It's amazing to see sometimes. I'm going to share our stories because we've got a lot of them today, although a whole bunch of them are all around Artemis. Did you stay up and watch the, watch the launch, Sonia? No, I actually saw it this morning afterwards. <laughs> One o'clock was kind of hard because I had to work till late last night. Yeah, I set, I set my thing. Here is a video. I'm showing a video here of just off the coast of Canaveral there. And you can see just how bright it was. And it is just insane going from total darkness to almost total daylight within seconds and then switching right back to night from this. Uh, I, lo I, I woke up at one o'clock to go look out the look out the back stood in the backyard looked at it um we have a few too many trees to see the orange part as it was first getting off the ground but then you could see the i shared it on my various feeds you could catch this right here it was this bright up in the sky and then right before uh the boosters separate it was awesome yes when the boosters separate you head up and with three lights it was it was really really cool to see um letting it go just a little bit longer and there we go into the clouds um so it's really fun i mean i i so you're a space person too so <laughs> this is one of those really fun things to do i'm going to share the the cool library fact and i'll as always all these links will be in the show notes we did a talk back in August about this, um, about the Ar Artemis launch with Slade Peters, who is the person in charge of recovering this capsule on December 11th. So the link will be there for you to go listen to his talk. Um, it was really fun to talk about all the different pieces and parts of Artemis from launch like this all the way until uh, Artemis 4, uh, when they were going to actually put people on the moon. But the Artemis name is actually very apt because the original lunar missions were Apollo, and that is the Greek god of the sun. And his twin sister is Artemis, and she's the Greek goddess of the moon. And since one of NASA's goals is to put a woman on the moon, as well as um, other diverse candidates, it's, it's wonderful to see that yeah. name used the female it is isn't it and and there's so many things as part of this whole artemis mission set um that we've talked about before there's a artificial astronaut on board you know crash test dummy if you will that has got a ton of sensors on it to track all these things because remember this rocket's going farther than any other human rated piece of machinery has ever gone this is going out farther away than Apollo ever did in anything. There's the new Amazon A word <laughs> um, voice assistant that is built into this capsule so that the people will be able to test and use this um, as part of doing all the things around the thing. And we sent out our own CubeSats, the Cube satellites, the small little mini ones, Capstone arrived there first to be there to wait for Artemis to get there. So it's got its own little satellite system around the moon now for people 
astronauts, et cetera, Artemis is going to go test this to communicate back and forth with each other around the moon and with the other devices that are in orbit there. Well, it really shows the internationalness of the effort because the capstone payload was actually launched by a rocket in New Zealand. Yep. And they actually use very little propellant to do it. They yeah. set up a new system. It takes longer, but it used practically no propellant to get it up into lunar orbit. And that's an exciting idea because one of the biggest limitations in space travel is having enough fuel to get there. Not only fuel, but then the ability to keep it in orbit around the moon. Um, the Earth's gravity is pretty constant and stable and predictable. The moon's much less so, and we have less detailed information about it. Not only is it less stable than our planet, the moon stuff, we don't even, we don't know enough about it. We've only got those Apollo missions from back when. Well, in the Apollo era, when they sent the ship there, they would lose contact with it when it went behind the moon. Mm -hmm. It's not like, like this. I think the hope is that they can maintain contact for longer while it's yeah. Orbit. It's 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 creating this whole ecosystem around the moon. Uh, so by 2025, the hope is we're out there, we're doing stuff. It's going to be interesting. Another launch. Well, let's get this one back first, and then we'll we'll look <laughs> look at the future launch schedules. Right? It's going to be just crazy. And one other piece of space news for things. So we have an unmanned military space plane. We talked about it two years ago on the show when they launched one, and it's been up there for 908 days, and it just came back. Well, it's really exciting because the last time we met and we spoke, we talked about the new Space Force, and this is one of their initiatives of what is they're it, doing. And yeah, it, a it's a lot of experiments thing. on it. And thank you for rem for bringing that back up because, yeah, this is why we need a Space Force. Because the original time that they started doing this, and you can see on here how long this thing has been up there, USAF, because it was an originally an Air Force plane that is now part of that has all been folded in to the Space Force so that there's one military unit. Remember Veterans Day, Veterans Month is what we're doing around here. There is only one space unit now, unlike it was the broken up in between Navy and Air Force and, and on, there was actually a separate satellite command. Now it's all wrapped up under the one and they are now able to fly these planes 908 days. It's a, and it's unmanned, so they have yeah. the technology to keep it going without having anybody on board. Unmanned drones up there since 2010, they've gone 3,774 days of having one of their two, we believe there's only two of them, uh, planes up there uh, orbiting and doing taking care of stuff. So... The guess is that now this one is back, the other one is up there. But since these are pretty secret missions, we'll never actually know the full details as civilians, I don't think. What you write about Space Force combining the services, this craft had experiments from the Naval Research Laboratory and the U.S. Air Force Academy. So it's a good, and they can, and they also have satellites. They launched the Falcon Sat 8. Yeah. And this and is those, a good way for them to do research as well as the other things they do. That yeah. We don't know about. Yeah, exactly. And this is one of those things where they they go out and actually have different universities, different organizations who are building these small little CubeSats that they will give them a chance to fly long-term experiments in space that can't get into the International Space Station or don't need to go there because they don't need any maintenance like they do for that. It's something you can actually work with the Space Force to get your individual project up flying around the planet for a year, two, three years, and then come back and test out exactly how your individual item survived, both launch up and launch down. 
Yeah. Being up there 908 days allows for more experiments than you can do in other places except for the international space stations. Yeah. Final story about space today. I know we're just going on about space because it's it's that kind of week. It was a, it was a great weekend. Um, tied in with all of the other miscellaneous stuff was this crazy weird discovery. They found a part. Uh, let me get, if I can get a good picture of it. They no, they don't have a really good picture. It's a paused video. I dislike. Um, they found a piece of the shuttle. Challenger. Remember the space shuttle Challenger blew up uh, shortly after liftoff 30 years ago. Hard to believe it was that long ago, huh? Yeah. Um, and some divers that were out in the Bermuda Triangle looking for something else stumbled upon this and NASA just on the 11th uh, confirmed that it is a actual part of the shuttle and they're doing what they can to recover and um, refurbish it for viewing as part of the astronaut um, center. It would be wonderful to see them added in because of for these lives yeah. lost in the pursuit of space. It can make a very good uh, presentation to teach people about it. I remember when that happened because I was in yeah. college at the time and it was I, I was I was in the Marine Corps. I remember being in the we were cleaning up the electronics lab and I remember I have room in my hand sweeping and we just had the thing playing. It's like, yeah, 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 another shuttle launch. Who cares? This is an average day thing for us nowadays. And then just everybody going silent and then the chaos of trying to figure out what just happened. And it, yeah, it was still emotional about all of that. It was just craziness. Yes, it was shocking, but they did learn some things with it that mm -hmm. I think are being applied to their new program, such as the Artemis program. I mean, space travel is never going to be safe, but they can try and make it as safe as possible. Yeah. And it's definitely going to be interesting to see if they can bring this back up off the ocean floor. Um, they're not so sure certain that they can uh 37 years it's been more than 30 37 years total wow just wow okay then um that's our space coverage for this week oh i'll try we'll see how many other stories we can cram in later on but i'm thinking december 11th so when that landing comes down go and listen to that podcast beforehand so you'll know exactly what we're talking about when that gets to us and uh, like we said at the beginning of the show, anyone who ever has any stories, creation station at Broward.org comes right to me to put them into the thing. Someone sent us this based on our story last week about uh, the city of Corpus Christi and doing uh, water desalination plants and stuff like that. So go back and watch last week's episode while it's still relevant. There is a brand new way, maybe, probably, of doing uh, desalination from removing the salt from salt water so that you can get fresh drinking water. It does a lot better at less energy. Did you get a chance to look at this one, Sonia? I did look at that, and I found it interesting because I've also found an article about how California is planning to put in a desalination plant because they're anticipating a 10% loss of the state's water yeah. supply by 2040. And they're looking to put in a desalination plant to try and do it. They may end up using some of this more sophisticated technology to make it happen because anything that uses less energy and is a better way of doing it is will make it much more feasible and also affordable. Yeah. yeah. Uh, right now they do have, uh, I think, two or three desalination plants on the California coast. They all happen to be near the nuclear reactors because they need a lot of power to be a, a constant stream of power to be able to, to take care of all of that. So th this would just make it so much better to be able to pull this off, not only here in the United States, but all around the world at places where you can operate these at such a lower power um, thing and creating it like it's it's almost it's kind of like a mini condom when you look at it actually it does actually it's, 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 it? 
Um, because and that's what it is. I mean, it's just got this little membrane that it, all the water gets forced through, and because of how it does this chemical vapor, chemical vapor deposition is their official term for it. But basically, it is using the power to change your water from uh, liquid to vapor and back to liquid, so it passes through at a easier, uh, faster rate. And they discovered the fast water transport through the main membrane. It was an unexpected result. So it just goes to show how science, science. will throw yeah. something at you and that you can use and when they're not really expecting it. It would be wonderful because it's not just California. A lot of places, um, yeah. the United Arab Emirates has quite a few that desalination plants because they're they live in the desert. And yes. I think all over the world, water is going to become a much more critical issue. Yeah. And the the listener who sent this one in it was about the five desalination plants that were supposed to be built and haven't been built yet in Texas and Corpus Christi. So thank you very much for letting us know about that. Uh, another science story is uh, GMO plants. Not going to eat them this time. Uh, we're going to be using them as dehumidifier slash humidifier air purifier things in our houses, probably. Um, as always, we try very hard on this show to only go to things that are things you can purchase and use right now in your life, even if it's on a limited basis. And sure enough, you could if you lived in France, you could buy and put these in your home right now today. Well, one of the reasons we're looking at plants and genetically engineered plants is because some of the things that we have that are volatile organic compounds, like you get from cleaning supplies and whatnot, it is actually the plants do a better job of cleaning that than other purifiers. And then again, we're going back to the power issue. If a plant uses solar power, it doesn't need to use any other power. And so you can put quite a few of them in your house yeah. and refresh it that way. So it's a wonderful idea. And All you need is a window and it'll work. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's really a, a great way of dealing with several different issues at once. You don't have to go buy one of these specialized plants. You can use any plant in your house. It'll help purify your air. It's just that. The Neo Plants, the company that did this, has created one that's more than 30 times as powerful as other plants that have been developed by NASA, by other other corporations out there to try and do these things because NASA's big on air purification too, space station as we mentioned, et cetera. Well, it's very important for people who live in places like apartments where you can't have yeah. dirty plants to, to have the capability in one. So yeah. it's a way to, to allow, enable a lot of people to actually take advantage of this sort of technology. Yeah. $180 is not a horrible price, I guess. I mean, it's a lot more than you would pay for a regular plant, but considering how much you would have to pay for a air purification unit and then the electricity to run it, that's really cheap. And I think that they might be able to, governments might give you a subsidy to do it like they do with solar. So you never know. It could yeah, be that, you know, accessible. That would be interesting. Yeah. That's an interesting idea. I don't think that's even on the drawing board right now, but that's a really good suggestion. Yeah. We got to send that into Washington and see if they'll uh, add that to the bill next time, right? Yeah. Yeah, it only help. Give, give me a thing. Give me a. You'll give me a thing on my uh, electric car. Give me a. Give me a rebate on my plants too. That'd be interesting. Or they may find a way to make it even cheaper. Instead of yeah, I guess if you. How do you mass produce plants though? You know, how plants only grow so fast. So. Well, I think the process has to be made um, cheaper so that each individual one becomes cheaper. Yeah. So you have to wait and see. But I think it's a, that's one way of, if it's really successful, it's one way of, um, if the government subsidizes, it's one way of getting it out to a lot more people. Yeah, you know, that's a, I mean, it's a pythos. I wanted to look at the exact, yeah, pothos. It's a pothos plant. 
Um, so if anybody out there has a, can uh, hit us up with some knowledge about how long does it take for a pothos to grow and how do you, how fast can you split it out and grow all the little sprouts from one, let us know. It'll be a good thing. And one last, we got time, don't we? Let me let check. Yeah, sure. we, we, got, we got time. We got time. Um, this is a very special uh, South Florida story. Um, we have the bonneted bat down here that you may or may not know we actually have this particular bat in Broward County and in South Florida, mostly because nobody sees them and they don't exist anywhere else except for the, the South Florida area, the, the five counties down here. I was kind of surprised. I had always thought that they that this was just a bat that was down here, but it was also other places. It wasn't until this story that I was like, wait a minute, what? It's that endangered that it's already disappeared from the rest of Florida and now it's only South Florida in the Everglade area and stuff like that. So, Well, they do eat mosquitoes, and if you're going to get a lot of mosquitoes, South Florida yeah. is the place for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now all we have to do is stop using the pesticides and the bats could take care of it. But unfortunately, because of all the insecticides and pesticides people have been using in their yards, these bats are, have now been announced to be even more endangered. Um, well, I think it's just believe, research yeah, huh? tells us about where they go and how they move around. There may be a way to avoid putting the yeah. pesticide where they are. Yeah, and one of the ways that they have found to track these is by sound which is actually where this story came to me. I was like, huh, why didn't this come to me from some other space? But this came to me in one of my sound um, feeds that I look at for music. And this came up because they were using some special microphones to try and detect the sonar signals that the bats emit. And how that's how they're trying to track these as they move around the South Florida area is by setting up these microphones and seeing if they can capture the squeaks and sounds that the bats make because they're so hard to detect visually from where they are. So I was just like, wow, huh? Well, because they're mostly out at night. And even though they're quite large, I think 20 inch yeah. wingspan, that's pretty mm -hmm. big. Yeah. And I've got I've seen small bats around my house. Um and you know and out in the parks around my area. So I would just was kind of thinking, well, of course that's how you track things is you you do you put up a trail camera and you take you snap pictures or whatever but it turns out especially with this particular bat species you're going to have to use sound just to do that so keep an ear out i guess we can't really keep an ear out for this one they need the special mic microphones to hear them but still well, i think the idea of finding out where they are and how they move around is the secret to preservation because then you can they say that these live in people's houses, and part of the problem is that all the construction that we're having is kind of eliminating their habitats. Yeah, I'd love to be able to put a bat house up in the backyard and see what see what roosts there and does it. Haven't quite convinced the wife yet about that. <laughs> she she's a little more uh, hesitant than I am, but I'm like, oh come on, it would be cool. Come on, just think about it. Going up to go to Sydney. I was in Sydney, and they have these huge fruit bats flying around from tree to tree in broad daylight. I, had, I, mean, yeah, I just yeah, stood yeah. there yeah. staring. You oh don't yeah, when, really I, see when I was stationed at Okinawa, we had them on base. Yeah, it was crazy. Yeah. Those monster fruit bat things, amazing. Thank you so much for being here, Sonia. It, it was, always flies by with you. We always get so many cool stories. Um, what's going on at Weston? Anything coming up that you guys have for programming wise? Oh, we were planning on having a program on Saturday, but I think we had to reschedule it. I am having a vet fest program on Tuesday, November 29th. And we will Excellent. be having a talk with Brian Turner and it should be, uh, actually very exciting. He is. A poet and memorist who served seven years in the Army. He's an author of two poetry collections. 
and he has won awards for his poetry. His work has been published in National Geographic, the New York Times, Poet Daily, Poetry Daily, and Harper's Magazines. And he will be giving a discussion of his readings from his work, a discussion of his work. And this one will actually be very interactive. We'll be, I plan to put everybody on the panel so that you can speak to Brian and interact with him. So, I so, so it's going to be an online event? An online event okay. on Wednesday, November 29th from 6 to 7 p.m. And yes, I, I welcome everybody to come to our calendar at... Uh, yeah, Broward.org slash library slash events has everything there, including this Saturday Storybook Festival at Southwest Regional Library in-person event. Probably going to be a couple thousand people there. Show up. Come see. We're doing a special mystery theme this year. So I'm not going to tell you what it is. It's a mystery. So you got to come out and find out. Let me throw up our final slide here really quick. As always... If there's a special librarian or library you want to see featured on the show, email us, creationstation at broward.org. We'll see everybody next week. Hope to see you at our library, too. Thank you very much.